David, one of the things I enjoyed about your lecture on objective knowledge was the way you introduce the ideas of intrinsicism and subjectivism as alternative approaches to knowledge right. to be compared with the approach of really being objective in the way Ayn Rand meant. And it might be uh, good for us to talk a little bit about who are the intrinsicists and subjectivists because I think if you go and look in a history of philosophy textbook, you're not going to find the section on the intrinsicist <laughs> and the section on the subjectivist. No. Um, uh, <clears throat> these are terms that are really unique to objectivism in the way that, that uh, uh, they're used. Subjectivism is a common term, of course, but intrinsicism less so. And uh, so, yes, this is, uh, this is, I think, Ayn Rand's most fundamental insight and most important. And uh, it because she's in defining or, or contrasting her view of objectivity against these other two models of knowledge. Uh, that really is what gave the philosophy its name, objectivism. So the, it, who's an intrinsicist? Well, Plato, of course, is the classic example. Plato believed that uh, our concepts, our ideas for things like man or good or virtue were uh, stood for actual, he called them forms, but they were literally abstract objects that existed in some other dimension. <clears throat> and um, there are many other philosophers in mathematics, for example, many mathematicians still, and philosophers of mathematics, this is still a very um, uh, widespread view, believe that Mathematical concepts and ma mathematical truths are the, the concepts stand for there really is a world of numbers somewhere <laughs> that there's a two out there, not just the word two or the concept not two. Like these two fingers. Yeah, not like the, these no, it's not these, these two, two fingers, fingers or these two, right? Uh, or those two books, but it's um, just two, pure two, and uh, and you can kind of see why people get drawn to that because it, it's a simple answer to the question, what makes our knowledge objective? That's what the goal is. Now, Plato said, look, we, if our words mean anything, they have to stand for something. But the word man doesn't stand for you. The name Will Thomas stands for you. But man, it, we are all instances of this concept. But the, the concept itself, what makes it a valid concept, is, um, has to be this abstract universal existing out there somewhere. Uh, and similarly with the mathematicians, um, you know, they right. want mathematics. How, how do you explain the reality of mathematics? Because, you know, two doesn't mean two fingers or two books. Um, there's no, nothing in the world that is a two-dimensional triangle uh, exactly so anyway that's that's part of the appeal one of the things that I think is interesting about Rand's identification of intrinsicism is that we see even contemporary thinkers who show these same characteristics I mean, one of the most famous modern philosophers for mm -hmm. defending the reality of knowledge is a philosopher named Hilary Putnam mm -hmm. who's famous for his causal <clears throat> theory of reference and the causal theory of reference boiled right down to it is that the concepts that are really, really confirmedly meaningful are confirmedly meaningful because we can identify stuff in reality that's exactly the same in all the cases. So the classic example is water is H2O. It is that, uh, it's, uh, that, that molecular exactly. signature and it's exactly the same in all water. Uh -huh. Therefore, there's a universal. Therefore the word water is meaningful because we can see this one-to-one -one match of the word to the exact same thing right. in these different cases. Um, yeah, that's a good example. Um, uh, it's a sophisticated version of intrinsicism, um, but you're absolutely right. And, and another aspect of this, you re mentioned the causal theory of reference. That, that idea is that words get it, come to, a word stands for something in the world, a type of thing like water. Uh, because someone initially named this stuff water. 
but he wasn't just giving it a name like Lake Erie. Uh, uh, he was uh, he he intended to say stuff like this, stuff with the same nature, and so that's the intrinsicist part, the idea that there is in an identical same nature throughout. Yeah, good example. Yeah. I think <clears throat> contemporary subjectivists are more a dime a dozen. Um, you, for, sure. for instance, studied with Richard Rorty, <laughs> yeah. uh, right. who was a famous contemporary subjectivist who uh, held that we didn't have subjective knowledge and was a, uh, I mean, you know more about his thought than even than I do, after all, you studied with him at <laughs> Princeton. So. Uh, yes, um, he, he didn't, he thought basically that um, uh, whether a statement's true or false, is simply a matter of whether in our culture, in our society, with, with the people engaged in our conversation, so to speak, he used that in a broad sense, um, uh, agree with it. So it, it comes down to what's called intersubjectivity. So the, you know, it's not willful whatever you believe, but the constraints are just other people, not other minds, not, he, he uh, uh, thought there was no, it made no sense to talk about, as he, would, as he would have put it, stepping outside our minds to check whether the things we say and believe correspond to what's out there. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's fascinating, actually, because when we talk about these things in philosophy and these very fundamental epistemological ideas, people think a little bit, oh, that's interesting, perhaps, uh, but it's a little airy fairy. It's airy fairy. But in recent years, there's been a backlash starting to grow in practical science against this very idea of intersubjectivity. Because researchers are finding, for instance, that in many scientific fields like medical uh, research, biological research, the research that's getting approved by the intersubjective uh, principle in the peer reviewed journals. Oh, right is coming out, being published, all the authorities in our conversation say this is good work, but people that need it to actually be true so that they can actually make medicines from it find it doesn't work and it isn't true. And so there's, How bad uh, in, is in it? very many, uh, very many cases, and there's some people saying it's the majority of the, oh the, the results that are being published in the scientific journals right now in the areas of biology and medicine. So it's a, there's, but there's some, some people both in academia mm -hmm. and in the more applied sciences in the corporate world that are really fighting back against this because it really matters whether what you're pursuing is the truth and not just what everyone happens to agree with. Yeah. Well, I, on top of being a great example, um, uh, it's scary. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a good object lesson in the fact that these fundamental philosophical issues actually have, can have a huge impact on our lives.